Quaternaires and metabolism and newborn screening. Uh, she's been an investigator in numerous natural history studies and clinical trials for new therapies. So she's going to speak to us on newborn screening for MPS disorders and what is the role of advocacy. Welcome. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here uh, and have the opportunity to talk about something I'm really passionate about and, and th something that I think is so important for the MPS disorders, and that's newborn screening. I, I know that some of you may be very familiar with this, but others may, may not really know how the newborn screening works in the United States, so I thought I'd first just tell you a little bit about newborn screening in general. Uh, every newborn baby, before they leave the hospital, gets tested for certain genetic disorders uh, by newborn screening. Uh, they get a blood sample taken from the heel, spotted onto filter paper like you see in this slide. And many people refer to this as the PKU test because there's a genetic disorder called PKU that was the first disease for which we had newborn screening. But now in every state, more than 35 different disorders are included in newborn screening. And newborn screening for at least some disorders is really done throughout the developed world, uh, although it varies widely from country to country in terms of which disorders are included. Uh, we still have a ways to go to get this into the developing countries, but uh, it is, has certainly become very widespread. And the way it works in the U.S. is that newborn screening is run by state health departments. Each state decides what conditions are going to be tested for in babies and how they're going to do the testing, and they run and implement, implement the screening program. And years ago, there was just huge disparity across state lines in terms of which conditions were included. You might deliver a baby in one state, uh, and not be screened for a potentially lethal disorder and, you know, 20 miles down the road if you had delivered across the state line, you would have had screening. So many of our professional organizations recognize this disparity as a big problem and there was a federal advisory committee created called the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Heritable Disorders and Genetic Diseases in Infants and Children. That came into being about 15 years ago, and that is a committee that makes recommendations to the health, uh, Department of Health and Human Services with regard to which disorders should be included in newborn screening. And those are on the list called the Recommended Uniform Screening Panel, or RUSP for short. So you'll hear that term, is that disorder on the RUSP. These are recommendations only, however. States are not required to screen for the conditions on the RUSP, and they can certainly choose to screen for other things that are not on the list, and, and states definitely do. Uh, but in general, most states tend to fall in line. If a disorder gets onto that recommended panel, eventually, usually, most states will include it in their screening program. Now, currently, there are 35 disorders on the RUSP, including one MPS disorder, and that is MPS-1. Uh, there is an established mechanism for nominating new disorders, and MPS-2 will soon be nominated. The nomination is going to come from the National MPS Society, although a number of different physicians involved in the process have worked on putting this all together. Um, but really, uh, all MPS disorders are good candidates for newborn screening, and we'll talk about why. There are some general requirements that the Re Federal Advisory Committee looks at in determining what's a good disorder uh, to be a candidate for newborn screening. The first is clearly that the disorder has to be serious. It has to be something that's medically consequential. You know, we're generally not going to do newborn screening for something like color blindness, for example. Uh, there has to be a test that reliably detects the condition, and it has to be a test that can be done on that dried blood spot 
on that filter paper specimen. And we want it to be a test that doesn't give us too, too many false positives. In other words, we don't want to have too many babies that have to come in for further testing who don't turn out to have the condition. There will always be some, uh, because that's the nature of screening. We don't want to miss anybody, and, and so we're selecting patients who need to have further testing. So there'll always be some, but we don't want it to be you know, an unacceptable number such that it's burdensome. Uh, there should be a treatment for the condition. Uh, and there should be evidence that initiation of treatment prior to the time of typical clinical diagnosis is beneficial. Because if you can just diagnose the condition clinically and go ahead and treat it and then everything's fine, well, we don't really need newborn screening, right? So there's got to be evidence that treating before the condition would typically be diagnosed is helpful. And finally, we need some pilot data and our committee at the federal level wants data from the United States uh, that shows that the test works, that you can detect the condition uh, using the test before they'll approve addition, adding a disorder to the RUSP. They certainly do consider data from other countries, but there has to be some experience in the United States. So why would we want to do newborn screening for MPS disorders? Uh, well, one big reason, which has already been alluded to here by Dr. Clark, and I know you're all very familiar with, is that it would avoid the diagnostic odyssey. I'm sure many of you have had the experience of having your child have symptoms for years, uh, maybe seeing multiple physicians before you finally got an accurate diagnosis. Sometimes we'll see a family where that's been going on, and in the meantime, they've had another child or a couple more kids, some of whom may also be affected before they get that diagnosis. So just avoidance of the diagnostic odyssey would be, you know, an endpoint of newborn screening. But the biggest thing would be it allows early initiation of treatment before permanent irreversible damage occurs. We just heard a great discussion from Dr. Clark about how there's a point in time, presumably, where you know there has been a point of no return, basically, where you are not going to be able to prevent all disease manifestations with treatment, even if you initiate uh, effective treatment. So the benefit of newborn screening is that patients can get treatment at the earliest possible point in time when we know it's going to have the maximum in impact, it's going to be most efficacious. And then finally, newborn screening allows us to provide genetic counseling to families who are at risk for having future affected children and allows them to get information regarding their reproductive options. So the MPS disorders really meet all the criteria uh, for making them good candidates for newborn screening. They're undoubtedly serious. We have tests available for every one of the MPS disorders that can be done on that dried blood spot, and they can be done in such a way that we can use them for what's called high throughput. You can do 500 specimens a day, which is what's required oftentimes in a newborn screening laboratory. We do have treatment now for many of the conditions, and as you've heard, treatments, investigational treatments in the works for the others. Uh, but it's already here, and it's already approved for MPS 1, 2, 4A, 6, and 7. Uh, and there is a lot of personal experience that tells us that treatment before clinical recognition is beneficial. We know that's true. Our data are not quite as expansive as we'd like them to be because we just haven't had the opportunity many times to treat patients before the diagnosis is made clinically. We do have some data from younger siblings treated, and we all have experience with patients like that, and we know that the outcome is absolutely best when treatment is started early. Uh, but for some of our diseases, we really de do need more data gathering in that area. With MPS-1, it was abundantly clear because there was literature showing that transplant, for example, prior to one year of age 
is associated with a better outcome than transplant after one year of age. Now, uh, several states started newborn screening for MPS1 well before the condition was added to the RUSP. Like I said, that can happen. States can decide to add other disorders to their screening panel. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in the end about the role of advo advocacy in this whole process and what you can do. But I can tell you that the reason screening happened in these other states and the reason that we now have MPS1 and hopefully we'll have MPS2 on the uniform panel is that families made it happen. I mean, the doctors didn't make it happen. Families made it happen. They led, they led the way, led the charge in their individual states to get legislation passed to add these disorders to their own state's newborn screening panel. And if that hadn't happened in Missouri, we would not have had the data that would have allowed us to get MPS1 on that recommended uniform screening panel. If it hadn't happened in Illinois with legislation in our state, which now we have data on MPS2, and there's more data coming from Missouri, again, we wouldn't have any pilot data now. We wouldn't be able to go to the Federal Advisory Committee and say we need this added to the RUSP. So families have been important the whole way through. Um, and you can be important, again, as we move forward, I think, with the other conditions. So newborn screening for MPS1, because it's on the RUSP, is now becoming widespread in the U.S. It's also ongoing in Taiwan. There are several different laboratory methods that can be used. We don't really need to go into those, but these are methods that could be used in any newborn screening laboratory. But all of the methods measure enzyme activity. So the way that babies are screened for MPS1 and the way they could be screened for any of the other MPS disorders is by measuring the amount of enzyme in that dried blood spot. Same basic test that you or your child would have had for the initial diagnosis. Um, it may be possible at some point to also measure the, the mucopolysaccharides, the glycosaminoglycans. You can do that in the dried blood spot. That is not our first line test currently. It's being done by enzyme activity but that may be a second tier test and if we could uh, see that testing done with fewer false positives it might be a way we could screen for all MPS disorders. Here is the map of where MPS1 newborn screening is currently going on. The states in sort of that rust colored red are states where every baby now is being screened for MPS1. You can see it includes most of the big population states, New York, California, uh, and Illinois, of course, Minnesota, all, all of the states in red. The ones in purple uh, have passed legislation and are in the process of adding MPS1. Um, there's one little state in green where there's legislation active and there's some where, you know, there's nothing going on currently or nothing more than talk but no definite plans uh, at this point for implementation of MPS1 newborn screening. This map changes all the time. I mean, new states are coming online over time. so. There will be more red states as time goes on, but some are obviously slower than others in terms of getting this underway. But it's already happening, you know, for many, many of the babies in our country. So what happens after a positive newborn screen? Let's say you're in a state that does MPS1 newborn screening. The enzyme activity is measured in the dried blood spot. It's below a cutoff where a baby needs to have further testing to confirm whether or not this is truly MPS1. Uh, that's what it means. Uh, a positive screen doesn't mean that a baby has MPS1. You don't make the diagnosis from newborn screening. Newborn screening identifies patients, babies, who need to have further testing 
to figure out if they have the disease. Sometimes they don't have the disease. Maybe they're carriers. Some carriers have low enzyme activity. So we do pick up some carriers. We also have a condition called pseudodeficiency. And we see that with all of our uh, lysosomal disorders. This is a situation where you can have low enzyme activity because there is a change in the gene, but it does not cause disease. So presumably the enzyme activity in the body is higher than what we're measuring in the test tube. So it looks like the patient is deficient, but really they never get disease. That's called pseudodeficiency. It's very common for iduronidase, for the MPS1 enzyme, mainly in African Americans. We see it occasionally in other ethnic groups, but it, it's really very common. There are several variants in the gene that occur in the African population that lead to this situation where it looks like they have low enzyme activity, but they never get disease, and their urine gags are not elevated. You know, they're, they're gag they don't store gags. They, they just don't have any kind of disease. But we have to sort that out through further testing, right? But if a baby is diagnosed with MPS1, we get the positive newborn screen, we get the baby in, we repeat the enzyme, it's low, do the urine gags, they're high, We'll get the molecular testing, look at what the mutations are. Then our next step is to determine, is it the severe form of MPS1, you know, the Hurler form, or is it an attenuated form? And we can usually do that with the DNA analysis, with the mutations. So if we have a situation where we know a baby has the severe form, then of course they are referred right away for transplantation. And you can have a baby with MPS1 transplanted at two months of age, and you are gonna get the very best possible outcome. And similarly, if the baby has attenuated MPS1, then enzyme replacement therapy can be started early, and again, you're gonna get the very best possible outcome. So, um, that, that's the whole idea behind newborn screening. Now, uh, I mentioned we pick up carriers, we pick up pseudodeficiency. Sometimes you'll get a, one where it was just a bad sample for whatever reason, the enzyme kind of died on the filter paper and the enzyme testing when you do follow up turns out normal. You can do what's called second tier testing. Some of the states are after they get low enzyme activity on the blood spot, they are measuring the GAGs, the mucopolysaccharides, in that dried blood spot to sort out the pseudodeficiency. So they don't even have to call those babies in for testing because their GAGs are normal. Uh, so that could happen in some states. It's not going on in every state. Uh, but it does make the testing very precise. Uh, you get very few positives called out. This just shows in one series uh, from the Mayo Clinic who does the screening for the state of Kentucky that out of 138,000 plus infants, they only had two positive screens using that approach and one was affected and one was a carrier. The hazard of that approach is we don't know for sure if every newborn with attenuated MPS1 is gonna have elevated gags right at birth. We just don't have enough experience with that, testing samples from attenuated patients to know the answer to that. So I think that's a little bit of an open question for right now. But in any case, no question that the screening works. And there have been over 25 babies already in the United States identified with MPS1 by newborn screening who have had that incredible benefit of being able to have treatment in the early months of life. Uh, MPS2 screening is getting underway too. It's been ongoing in Taiwan. In the US right now it's being done on all babies only in Illinois and Missouri. In Illinois, uh, we have screened only about 264,000 infants. There's a zero missing here, I see, um, because we just started about two years ago, and uh, we have two MPS2 infants detected. 
Uh, the first baby with MPS2, I started on enzyme replacement therapy at three weeks of age. I just saw that baby at 20 months of age. He has absolutely no findings of MPS2 whatsoever, which is the same thing I have seen. Um, in another couple siblings started at birth, you can prevent virtually all of the somatic, the, the body manifestations of the disease with early enzyme replacement therapy. Um, of course, it doesn't cross into the blood-brain barrier, so we still need an effective treatment for the central nervous system in patients with MPS2. But there's no question that early therapy is efficacious for the somatic manifestations of the disease. Now there is newborn screening going on uh, for other MPS disorders in certain pilot programs and in other parts of the world. Uh, in Taiwan, which has really kind of been at the forefront of newborn screening for a lot of different conditions, they are doing testing for MPS 3B, 4A, and 6. Uh, there's been screening in Brazil for MPS-6 in a, in a community where they have a particularly high incidence of the disease. So we know from these screening programs that it can work for these other MPS disorders as well. So what can you do as a family to promote newborn screening if you believe, as I do, that this is something that's really going to be beneficial and important for the babies in our country? Uh, there are a lot of things you can do depending on your circumstances. First of all, I would say if you live in a state uh, where on that map nothing's happening for MPS1, which has now been on the rust for almost five years, uh, I would say go back to your state and find out why not. Uh, contact your state health department, find out what the status is, uh, what the plans are, when they're going to be initiating, initiating screening for MPS1. If you don't get satisfaction from that, go talk to your local legislator. Tell them, you know, that the babies uh, here in Mississippi deserve newborn screening for MPS1 every bit as much as the ones in New York and Illinois and California. Uh, and they need to get on it, you know, that there's been enough time that's elapsed that this should be now everywhere. Uh, if you uh, have a child with MPS2 and uh, you think newborn screening is important for MPS2, do the same thing. Uh, it's not on the RUSP, but you can go back and talk to your state health department, talk to your legislators and say, hey, babies in our state, they deserve it just as much as those babies in Illinois and Missouri. These states can do it. Why can't we do it? Um, you know, that our kids deserve the same thing, you know, that they have. Uh, and I can tell you that you know, health departments and legislators, they listen to patients and they listen to families, they listen to constituents. We can give them advice and talk all day long and, you know, they'll take some information from us, but it does not have the same impact. Uh, Crab A disease is another serious genetic disorder. It, it's not on the RUSP. It's never been on the RUSP. It was rejected from the RUSP. It's now ongoing in eight states, and there's more coming on all the time. Why? Because their advocacy organization is very active, and it gets their families to go for legislative action. And uh, that is the most effective way, really, oftentimes, to get things done. Um, I think if you find out at your state that this is being discussed. You can uh, find out, every state has a newborn screening advisory committee meeting. They have an advisory committee. They call it different things, but you can find out from the health department what is the committee, when do these meet. These are almost always open meetings. They're open to the public. You can say you want to speak at the meeting. Go to the meeting. Speak up and say, hey, you know, what's going on? You know, we're not even doing MPS1 newborn screening, and, you know, this has been on the rust since 2015. Or we need MPS2 or MPS4, you know, whatever the case might be. Get the dialogue going through that committee meeting. Um, and if you want quick action, 
go the legislative route. I mean, that's how it all started. So you can, everybody's got a local legislator. Uh, you can go and find out who's your representative in the state house, who's your senator. You can talk to that person, but I would say you don't even have to just use that person. I mean, if you're in your district, you've got, you know, a junior representative who was just, you know, elected this past session. They're not particularly powerful in the state house. Find out who is and try to find somebody who's sympathetic to the cause. I can tell you in Illinois what we did was we didn't talk, you know, I had a parent who was very interested in pushing this agenda. We didn't go talk to his legislator. We didn't go talk to my legislator. We found a guy who was high up, high ranking in the Senate of our state, who uh, was influential, who had been involved with newborn screening legislation for different diseases years before when we first started. And I had actually heard him talk at a March of Dimes meeting and say he felt like it was the most impactful thing he had done in his career. And I thought, that is the guy we need to talk to. He, he gets it, you know, so, and he's got, he, he can uh, move, it, move things around down in Springfield. So we drove three hours away and talked to him, and he got on board. And so he was very helpful. But also, you have to know the workings of your own state legislature. So figure out, let's say you get a legislator who's willing to introduce legislation for you to add MPS2, newborn screening, to your panel. Or you could get adventurous and, you know, add MPS4 or MPS6. Um, say you've got somebody like that. Well, then you need to find out what are the steps that it goes through, because usually you get a bill introduced, it goes to some committee. You know, it's going to be health services or some other committee. Lots of bills die at the committee level. They never get to the House for a vote or to the General Assembly for a vote. Because I can tell you, if you ever get a newborn screen out bill out there for a vote, it's a done deal. You know, there's no legislator in the world who's going to vote against doing newborn screening for a treatable disease that's going to improve the outcome for babies in their state. And even at the committee level, they're not going to be very likely to vote against it. In our state at the committee level, the Department of Health opposed it. The people within the state bureaucracy opposed it, yet not a single member of the committee voted against it because there were parents there who spoke to it, you know, and physicians who spoke to it. So the idea is not to let the committee chairman bury it and not get it out there. And the way you do that is you find out what committee it went to, who's on the committee, who's the chairman of the committee, and you all barrage their office with emails and phone calls and let them know you're watching, and it'll happen. But you have to know the workings of it, so you've got to find somebody who's relatively savvy who can help you do it. Um, so just to kind of sum up, I can't see my time, but I'm guessing it's running low. Um, newborn screening for MPS1 is becoming widespread. It's here. It works. It allows treatment to be initiated at a very early age, improving outcome for the patients and avoiding the diagnostic odyssey. Newborn screening for MPS2 is beginning and hopefully will soon become more widespread as these efforts continue, and certainly if we can get it onto the rust, that will you know, oil the pathway. Screening could be done for every one of the other MPS disorders. Uh, the technology is there to do it. Uh, families have been the main impetus for where we are right now for getting us to this point, and you can be powerful advocates for moving this forward. So thanks for your attention, and I don't know what the plan is. Are we going to have any questions now? or? No questions. All right.